Guru Nation, welcome back to another episode. Thank you so much for watching, listening, wherever you might be. I've got a really special guest on today, and uh, actually two guests, but Gail Hinkson, right? She's the president and CEO of Summit Clinical Research. They are an integrated research organization, so an IRO, which is a relatively new business model we're going to talk about, and they're specifically dedicated to NASH. And we're going to get into NASH. We're going to get into the IRO business model. We're going to get into what kind of technologies Gail and the Summit team uses at their sites. Um, what are the advantages of, of hyper-focusing on NASH? And we've also got Raymond. We've had Raymond on a few times. Uh, one of my favorite guys in the industry, Creo founder and CEO, and I'm a happy Creo client. This is also sponsored by Creo. My podcast is sponsored by Creo. It's sponsored by Inato and sponsored by Versatrel. So got all the intros out of the way. Gail, thank you for coming on. Absolutely. Thank you for letting me be here. So how did you get to Summit? I looked at your LinkedIn. You've been in research. Uh, you've you've worked in different therapeutic areas. And mm -hmm. what led you to, I guess, see the need for for having something like Summit even exist? Yeah. So I, I've been in the research space for nearly 30 years. Um, and in all phases of research, FDA regulated as well as federally funded. Um, and in one of those roles at Pinnacle Clinical Research, I was the CEO. We were focused on liver disease and GI disease in particular. Um, the medical director, Stephen Harrison, uh, Dr. Stephen Harrison, was is, is still an avid NASH researcher. So we, by nature, were doing a lot of NASH trials. And in around 2016, around that period of time, sponsors were really taking the approach of, of um, bringing on a, a high volume of sites to conduct clinical trials uh, in the NASH space. And each site was contributing two or three patients. Um, so it was a very costly endeavor for sponsors to do with low efficiency. Um, and our site at Pinnacle was able to put in a number of patients rapidly into these trials by, by specific targeting and using best practices and operational efficiencies. And that led sponsors to start to ask us, you know, can you do this with other sites? Can you bring other sites together to, to share this information and to learn it? And that became the impetus for, for Evolving Summit, which became a, a summit network of sites. The so sponsors came to you and said, hey, you guys are managing this so well internally. Yeah. Did they introduce you to some other sites or did they just tell you to go find them and see what you can do? You know, it was a mix. We, we'd been doing NASH trials for quite some time. And so we knew a lot of the players. We see the, the newsletters and meet them at the investigators meetings um, and had very collegiate relationships with a lot of the sites that were active at that time. Um, and, and so we started from there. We actually started with 15 sites in the network on our first trial. Um, wow. And, and yeah, that was it. It was a 20, 2018, we had 15 sites. Our objective was to enroll uh, 175 patients into NASH in 12 months. And, and we did that uh, with 15 sites. We actually enrolled 181 patients in, in less than 12 months. So that was the first time that it happened on a, a phase two biopsy proven NASH study. I think this is something interesting. Um when it comes to the future of clinical research. And we're going to get into that because I can kind of try to look forward and um, predict the future maybe. Um, and, you know, one of the funnest parts about having guests like you is I could literally ask you questions about what you're planning to do. And you guys are the ones writing the future of our industry. Um, you guys in the Nash space, but when it comes to IROs, I don't fully understand the business model. So yeah. I have a small site, Yuma Clinical Trials, and I have a site network, DSCS, but it, we charge a monthly fee, a small monthly fee. We have maybe 100 sites across the country mm -hmm. paying us to help them get studies, but all therapeutic areas yeah. will we'll do their budgets, but the, each one operates independently. We may share best practices if they want, but we don't force them to 
you know, to to do anything. We don't take anything from the budget. I I think that's a site network, like a loose site network. But mm -hmm. what's the difference between that and an IRO? Yeah. Yeah. So we're we're contracted by the sponsors to conduct these trials, to oversee these trials, not in the um, not in the uh, comprehensive vendor management way, although we do that for some trials. Um, but but really to bring forward the sites and to execute the studies, provide scientific input as well as operational expertise. The Nash space is somewhat of um, the Wild West. There is it's an evolving therapeutic area. Um, and so we really pride ourselves in staying on the forefront from a science standpoint, um, having key thought leaders in that space and being able to provide that insight to the sponsors, certainly. But then from the site side, being able to bring forward sites who are independent, so like a network, they are independent sites, they operate under their own um, processes and procedures. We provide operational expertise and insight. Um, which allows them to be more effective on those individual trials. Um, we we also look at where do they where do the individual sites want to go with their with their growth of their business? Do they want to evolve new sites um, in their in their under their umbrella? Do they want to expand into um, more clinical trials in the Nash space? And so we help them develop the strategies to do so. So we're benefiting the sites in their evolution, the execution of the trials and the sponsors we we have contracts and agreements with our sites but we don't they don't pay to be a part of the network it is it is um something that we do based on quality and and efficiency to execute so i imagine there's some some revenue share or some some uh, profit split maybe or for for us, we're we're contracted by the sponsor, so we're fully funded by the sponsor to execute. Oh, wow. The sites are funded by by the sponsor as well under the traditional model by a CTA. I see. Okay, this is so a model then. Yeah, so this is why I strongly suggest <laughs> Dale Gallagher. So, so the, just to be clear, like the term IRO has also been used to describe a different business model. Absolutely, There's the integration is with the care side, so it would be like a physician health network. That's right community physician practice integrating care into almost like Craco, like a research as a care option. That's and that right. was more of a traditional revenue profit kind of share arrangement like you described. So that's a, a tight contractual relationship. But this this is completely different. This is a Southern Clinical is actually not itself a site. It's a it's a but it's an independent entity, right? That's right. And, um, sites voluntarily join, don't pay anything. And by strengthening the sites and ensuring quality delivery, Summit is able to basically play part of the role of a CRO, essentially. And mm -hmm. I'm glad you said it first. Sponsor. I'm glad yeah. you said that first. The it, it, yeah, unlike, unlike the traditional model, the IRO that's linking care as a part of this, um, we are linking all the parties together to execute the trials as a whole and, and, and see these therapeutics through their evolution of phase cycle to hopefully an approved product, uh, as well as the sites, their evolution of their growth and and um, and ability to execute on trials. This is super interesting to me because I do think this is where research is headed. I think maybe little by little, and we'll see if it ever gets there like fully. But do sponsors approach you even if they already have CROs? Like, do you work together with CROs, or is the whole point of working with you so that they don't have to have one? It, it's a mix. We absolutely work with CROs. Um, so I think it depends on the size of the sponsor, their need and their internal structure, um, as well as the phase of the study. So certainly phase three trials, they need a CRO. It's really important. Um, phase two studies that are very large scale, multi-country um, uh, they generally need a CRO, but there are other trials that are smaller, a 1B, a 2A, um, where we can really fill the role in entirety for, for the sponsor's needs. And so that means, because a lot of the CRO capabilities, um, such as site selection, feasibility, yep. um, keeping sites organized, those yeah. kind of things you guys are doing. Yeah, in fact, for for all of our trials, we really we do the site targeting and the feasibility CDA process. We generally do the budget and contract negotiation on behalf of the sponsor. Um, uh, 
and then and then we provide the strategy for patient targeting um, and then we evaluate throughout the course of the trial. But in scenarios where where there is no CRO or a sponsor is it does not want a CRO involved, then we bring forward our partners, um, whether that's an FSP provider um, working with Creo to establish um, the, the the data collection and and transmission from an EDC or non traditional EDC standpoint. So we really are able to fill the the role on a smaller scale um, without a traditional model and. And that's that's sort of what Summit is all about: is finding the pathway forward. Clinical research is inundated with a lot of um, uh, red tape and and redundancies, and there is a more effective way to do research without sacrificing quality. Yeah, I think tech. I mean, one of my theses before even learning about you guys is technology. Each technology, whether it's Creo, whether it's Versatrel, Medifactor, there's hundreds of these vendors. Yeah. Not all of them equally successful, but each one kind of replaces one of the elements or maybe improves on one of the aspects that traditional CROs used to used to do, right? Yeah. And I feel like you guys are doing it with the tech-enabled tools, specifically Creo. We're going to get into Creo, but one of the questions I have is, well, a couple of things. One of the my first observations was I'm surprised there's this many Nash studies to support this business model. But apparently you don't think that's slowing down anytime soon. No, in fact, it's it's significantly ramping up. I think the the field of Nash has had a few hits, if you will. Um, there have been a number of trials that went through, products failed along the way. We call that the Nash graveyard. Um, but but it is a disease that is not going anywhere and is going to affect a sig significant amount of the of the population. And so it is really an important um, thing for for society to to evaluate research, find a treatment for. Um, it's a very complex disease. The liver itself is extremely complex. Yeah. Um, so there's multiple pathways for a potential drug. Um, and we're just really scratching the surface. We've got we've got products that are in phase three now that are likely to make it to the finish line and, and be marketed. Um, but there's improvements to be made and certainly combination drugs. So we've probably got a runway in Nash of, uh, you know, at least seven to 10 years. Wow. I'm going to ask this next question selfishly, and then we'll get to the other stuff. But my PI here in Yuma, we were just offered a NASH trial, or at least to do the feasibility. Mm -hmm. I've never done a NASH study. We've done a lot of psych, a lot of obesity, a lot of diabetes. I mean, we see the NASH patients. Sure. Um, do they all require liver biopsy, or is this like a myth? No, that so so they don't all require liver biopsy, but as the product is progressing through the phases, liver biopsy is the proven standard that the FDA accepts as evidence. Um, and so even though it's a surrogate um, marker for all intents and purposes, it is the gold standard. Um, mm -hmm. So by the time you get to a phase 2B, you're going to need to do a liver biopsy in the field of NASH. So if we want to get serious about NASH studies, we got to figure out the whole liver biopsy aspect. You do, and and not just the liver biopsy, but you do have to have imaging modalities and access to those special modalities like MRI, PDFF of the liver, MRE, fiber scan. There's a, it's very tech heavy, um, and 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 you need to have you know access to to ideally uh, medical records that would substantiate the blood markers. Yeah, we need good imaging. Sometimes in like underserved communities, that's that's hard to do. It's tough. Yeah, this is this is one of the major objectives I think that Summit has, and certainly the sites in our network are very focused on, is is reaching out further than the immediate area surrounding the research center, getting into the more rural communities, making sure that that people have the ability to participate in these trials if they want to participate and be able to to travel in, which is a lot easier said than done for many people in the country. Is a liver biopsy painful or? Well, it's not a good time. That that's for sure. <laughs> um, you know, it's 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 relatively innocuous for for what it sounds like. It's done with a with a 
a biopsy needle um, that is 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 inserted through the skin. It it um, goes in and takes a small core sample and retracts quickly. There's uh, local anesthetics that's that are used. Um, it, it's it's relatively innocuous, but certainly there is discomfort for sure, and and there is you know, the potential for bleed. So um, usually when you have a biopsy, you are staying at that facility where you had the procedure performed for a few hours afterwards so that you can be assessed and make sure that everything is good before you leave. And and for that day, just like with any procedure, you're really not doing anything else. You're, you're taking it easy that day. That, yeah. that alone is tough for many people who want to participate in trials. They do have to give up a day of their life um, in pursuit of this liver biopsy, whether they're participating in a trial um, or wanting to pursue a NASH therapeutic. And forgive my ignorance, but for for NASH in, in just the standard of treatment, standard of care, is it also something that's done routinely? And in- yeah, that's a great question. It's 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 not routinely done. So there is no there is no FDA regulated treatment at all. Um, mm-hmm. Really, what is prescribed typically is diet and lifestyle modifications, which can be effective. Um, if, if, a, if a person were to reduce their body weight by, you know, I think the estimates are 10%, then you can actually reduce the impacts of NASH, provided that you're not um, so advanced that you've developed cirrhosis. Um, however, we as Americans at least have a very hard time sticking to diet and lifestyle changes. And so we see these patients having this evolution of diet and exercise, loss of, of, of fat and, and uh, repairing of their liver um, only to cycle back to, um, to development of NASH and, and degeneration. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm thinking now hard, with the- Hard to recruit, right, Gail? I mean, isn't, isn't that like, this has historically been a hard indication. Is that because it's not routinely diagnosed? Yeah, uh, it, it is It is absolutely not routinely diagnosed. These patients don't feel bad, usually. It's, it's sort of a silent disease for all intents and purposes. And usually doctors start to notice something when they're seeing their liver enzymes fluctuate. And so that's usually the first indicator, but, but that can be a whole host of other things as well. And so oftentimes, um, you know, at some point a, a physician will say you need to have an ultrasound done and then they'll see some fatty liver echoing on that ultrasound. So it, it is, it's a very um, lengthy process, not well understood by, by the patient population. And oftentimes we still see physicians saying it's just fatty liver. It's not that important. It's not that big of a deal. That's definitely changing, but it wasn't so long ago that many physicians were still saying to their patients, it's just fatty liver. Yeah. I work in a busy clinic and my PI is like an obesity specialist. And when he sees elevated liver enzymes, the first thing he does is works on the obesity. But yeah. does that typically work for a majority of people with NASH? Or? It absolutely would work. So mm-hmm. as long as they're not cirrhotic, um, then yes, you can lose weight and improve your liver health and um, and reverse NASH. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, the, the key is staying with it. Can you stay yeah, with it for the yeah. rest of your life? How do you feel about these GLP-1s and Ozempic and I mean, we're seeing like a bunch of studies in that field where there's a bunch of Me Too or slightly better Ozempics coming out. Do you think that's going to impact NASH trials or they work hand in hand? I think they they work hand in hand. I mean, I certainly would have an impact on on the patient target target that could participate in trials, but there is still going to be a subset that won't that won't use those medications. And so there needs to be an alternative pathway. Wow, this is awesome. Yeah, I've never you like a um worked on nash so thank you for bearing with me and my ignorance on this topic um back to tech okay so you're running an iro Mm -hmm. you're it's almost like a layer on top of site network right like um an extra layer i imagine you can start doing qa on your sites um I have one site that I'm running, Yuma Clinical Trial. We have three locations, but it's the same staff, basically, sure. just different PIs. We use Creo, and I already have a QA person. You know, they're, like, doing our monitoring before the monitors come. I imagine you guys are doing this for your sites or using Creo yeah. to be able to do this. 
We do, both for our, our CREO sites and for our non-CREO sites, those that still use paper and haven't haven't made the adoption yet. Um, so we, we do come in and assess quality. What we're careful to do is we don't want to replace the role of the CRA um, on the trial and the, the monitoring of the actual study. We want to ensure that our overlay and assessment is about adherence to policy and practice and, and um, regulations. So that's where our QC is primarily focused unless a sponsor has asked us specifically to step in and evaluate the quality of the data um, separate from the monitoring of the of this study data. So they're not doing SDV um, or IP accountability, but they might be looking at protocol compliance and regulatory ISFs. That's right. Yep, that's exactly right. And so when did you, how does Creo come into your uh, IRO? Like when did you first have your first Creo experience? Yeah, so um, so we started using Creo at Pinnacle Clinical Research where I was the CEO. Um, so we were a client there um, as a site. I had been involved with um, with CTMS solutions and East, well before there was eSource solutions for for a long time as a as a trial management system. And we were using a former entity that that is um, no longer around. And and as I was looking out, I I came across Raymond. Uh, I reached out and said, Hey, I need to know about your your solution. And so um, we became a client uh, mm. at, at, at at Pinnacle and um, used it across our entire portfolio. And so when we moved into Summit, we continue to spread that message. We had, um, we have an annual meeting at Summit called the Summit Summit. It's a very catchy name. Uh, but where is we, it on a mountain? <laughs> it, it, it's in San Antonio where there are no mountains. Um, we, we do take it on the road a little bit, but, um, but we have all of our sites or most of our sites come together in a, in a single meeting where we can really talk about the performance that we've done over the course of the year and some quality measures and, and what's pertinent to the sites, I think. Um, and Raymond was gracious enough to come out uh, a, a few times and have have Creo represented there. And for what we found is that many of our sites really were not um, aware of eSource as a solution to improve their efficiency. Um, and so we've we've really embraced that idea of carrying that message forward because it's tremendous what you can do with with eSource and how that can change your entire business. Um, and, and strategy, and and we really believe that. So we we share that with our sites so much so that we 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 help them with that onboarding process and, and really um, improve the efficiency. We we help create source for for Nash trials specifically within our network. Work very very closely with the with the Creo group, and then beyond that, if we have a sponsor that is looking for a non traditional um, trial management data management solution, then we can do that um, with partnering with Creo as well, so that there is no traditional EDC, uh, but rather the e-source becomes the solution. So SDV yeah. goes away. You're just increasing the efficiency the whole way through, both on the site side and on the sponsor side. Yeah, we might want to talk about that uh, project <laughs> that we have going, Gail. You want to describe yeah, yeah, we we have we have a project that where where we are um, we have five sites and participating in this particular trial. It is um, it is a, a hepatic impairment trial, um, and there is a CRO involved in this particular trial um, who's providing a number of the solutions. But Summit has is is partnering with Creo to. Um, to be the solution for for the data management, if you will. So there is no traditional EDC system. We are we we take the data that's input into Creo as the data collection, um, and then through the platform um, reviewer, there the CRAs are able to look at the data. They're able to query the data as they would if if there's logic questions, but there's no need to SDV. There's nothing to SDV against. Um, the data is the data. And so right. you're just focused on the logic. Does it make sense? Um, is it appropriate? And are there additional questions that need to be asked? And so the quality overall is really increased. It's so much more high level, like SDR versus SDV. I have a CRA Academy and I teach the student, like the students try to do the lazy way, like, oh, well, the vitals matched 
you know, source and EDC. So we're good. Yeah. And then I asked them, well, look at the vitals and tell me if you think that's normal. Yeah. You know, they're not looking at the bigger picture. They're just looking to see if things match. So this is this is higher level monitoring. It, it's it's higher level data capture as well. So it, so it allows the team to really think about is 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 the vitals um, are they appropriate to the patient? Yeah. Um, and then and then for the monitor to be able to look at it and say yes, I agree that's appropriate to the patient. And and if they weren't, there was a proper procedure done to reevaluate, and the PIs made a notation of their assessment. So you get a really more comprehensive picture that's that's value based. Yeah, Ray, I'm actually surprised how quickly you guys were able to roll that out. As a Creo yeah. user for um, for just about two years now, like all the time and on and off, like four or five years, I I always envision, okay, like this would make sense. But Ray just brought it up yeah. a month ago that, hey, by the way, we have a EDC backend to all of this. Exactly. It, so... This is this is this is great for Summit Clinical because you're already using our eSource. A good number of your sites, a large number, are already essentially Creo eSource native and use it across the entire portfolio. Summit is already as part of their services, designing source templates and providing it to the sites mm -hmm. as as a service, and therefore delivering high quality and standardized you know output. And now for this trial, which is essentially sole sourced by Summit Clinical sites. There's absolutely no need to have another system. What is uh, novel about this particular project is that Summit Clinical essentially is also licensing on behalf of the sponsor, the reviewer application, which is a, a different part of our tech stack. It's not site facing, it's CRA sponsor facing. So the way it works is the Summit Clinical sites collect data and resource just as they do normally, right? And then they stop. There's no EDC entry. They're done. When the visit's done, they're done. Then our e-source will send the data in to reviewer mm -hmm. and it strips out the PHI. So the summit sites get to see the PHI. They knew who the patient is. They have cell phones. They have text capabilities. Um, you know, soon we'll be able to pull medical records in. I mean, there's all kinds of workflows that the site benefit from because it's a holistic end-to-end -end platform where PHI is is uh, critical, but just the study data tied to subject, you know, six or whatever is what gets sent into reviewer. And then this CRO that is, you know, a monitor who's third party independent from the sites uses that to review the data as it comes in, right? So it really should be a, a monitoring study that shouldn't have a lot of travel. Um, mm -hmm. and it should involve uh, monitors laying eyes on the source relatively quickly to capture, which is great in terms of identifying any issues or troubleshooting early on. And there's no SDV. So it is strictly SDR, what is the quality of the data, and really just kind of looking at the data holistically um, and ensuring you know quality, patient safety, all the things that sometimes get short shrift because in the traditional model, monitors are on site for eight hours and they spend half of it doing SDV and then they don't have enough time for some of the other vital functions. So I think this is a huge win for the sponsor and certainly for Summit Clinical. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think I think the with what you said, um, Raymond, where, where, where the critical parts of research are often overlooked because there's just comparing one set of data to another is fundamentally a flaw in research. Mm -hmm. And, and we don't need to, we don't need to do that if we have other options. And this is a, an excellent, excellent pathway to do that. I always say you don't pay CRAs six figure plus to check if the vitals match on a paper versus a EDC. Um, that's, that's, uh, we can, we, we don't need that for six figures a year per person. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Gail, what other tech do you guys use? And we'll come back to Creo cause I'm still exploring Creo's features here and there as a site owner, but what other tech do you guys use or do you encourage yeah. your sites? You, you don't force your site. Like, like you said, not all sites use Creo. You encourage certain things or, um, how does that work? We really do encourage a CTMS platform with an eSource solution, and 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 Creo is our preferred um, uh, solution for that. But it, but um, e-regulatory, uh, e-consent 
those are elements that we really encourage the sites to, to use. The financial management piece from a trial is a huge gap in, in the industry that without a solution like Creo or another um, solution similar, it's really difficult. We still see sites that are managing their financials on Excel spreadsheets. Um, so site facing tech solutions um, really are, are are housed in in these CTMS e-source e-solutions. Um, in in Summit, we we have some uh, homegrown solutions. We've we've built some some things off of Azure Tech Stack that really allow us to quantify the performance of the sites as a whole on a given trial across um, a trial portfolio for a site, um, and we can really provide some some key feedback to um, to how a site can improve their efficiency and reduce some of their, their losses, their screen fails, if you will. So we use a lot of internal tech that we've developed that benefits both the sites and the sponsors. For the sponsors, we look at the failure analysis in a way that incorporates much more scientific input than a traditional evaluation of screen failure. And then we affect change by saying, okay, this is what we're seeing. Let's tweak the, the strategy for the study as a whole or for this site as a whole, because uh, patient populations are not the same everywhere in in uh, you know across the country. So we really do a very customized approach using our internal tech stack for that. What about um, BizDev? So with a hundred sites plus worldwide, I'm sure some sites get some study opportunities that Summit maybe was not previously aware of. Sure. Um, I'm sure you guys have your own internal BD and you've been doing this long enough now to where sponsors know you, but there's always like the small biotechs that are a little naive to the landscape and maybe they just identified one of your PIs and not summit as a yeah. whole. Yeah. Do you guys like share leads among sites or? Yeah, absolutely. Most of the sites in our network do work exclusively with us for NASH trials. Um, and they they garner a lot of benefit from that um, in the support that we provide them. And so it's not uncommon for sites to say, hey, I was reached out to by this group or that group for this trial. And in fact, oftentimes those sites are responding back to the sponsor to say, I'm a part of the Summit Network and I would like you to contact Summit to do this trial because we have other colleagues in other sites and we we can effectively do this trial together um, by using Summit. And so there's a real benefit both for, for Summit, who, who is able to affect change on behalf of the sites um, and support the sponsor, and the sites reap from that. They are able to perform better, and they have a voice at the table through Summit with the sponsors. Do you, do you guys have like a portal or do you use like a shared feasibility Um like VersaTrial, for example, that stores the site info or yeah. anything like that. Yeah, we do, and and that's that's part of our our, our internal platform that we've developed. Um, so we do have feasibility information on our sites that we update uh, periodically as things change with the site, um, and that improves the efficiency of of getting information to the sponsor without adding that extra burden on the sites of complete this form. I think there's. From a site perspective, to me, there is nothing more infuriating than being asked to fill out a feasibility form for you know every single trial out there that says, "Tell me about your freezer. How many do you have? Any studies? Have you done them before? You know this this sort of information that can be really you know centralized and more efficiently done. That's just taking away from the objective of seeing the patients, providing them adequate care as a part of their research function, completing the work that's related to, to research and, and thereby diminishing the quality overall. You're spreading somebody too thin for this activity that has no substantial value of, of, re, of replicating. Yeah, have you built your own feasibility system internally or yeah use? yeah we did we we built our own uh system internally we do have fa um uh, site facing portals uh where sites can access their performance and their information and then we continue to add on that so that as their sites evolve into um other locations they can they can um update in that portal so that's wow. that's part of our evolution this year wow with your um, stature in the industry and your reach and your your you almost sounds like unique enrollment capabilities. It sounds like all Nash studies 
somehow go through some clinical in some form or another. I mean, yeah, a lot of them do. Our 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 performance as a as a group of sites is really unmatched. So in every trial that we've done, the summit sites outperform the non-summit sites hand over fist. So we might, for example, on a phase three trial, we might represent 18% of the sites, um, but we're responsible as a collective group for 45% of the enrollments. And so we see that reoccurring theme across every single one of the trials that we participate in. Um, so our method does work. It's, it's, it's not just uh, bringing sites together and saying, great, here you go, sponsor, and we're out. We're, we're in this for the long haul to benefit all the parties, ultimately the patients, and to, to have a solution for the disease state. What about staff training and education? I noticed on your website, and that's that's a huge issue. Huge. Sites are understaffed. And I mean, some of your sites are in locations where there's not exactly like an infrastructure for clinical research. Like where I am in Yuma, I have to handpick people just based off of potential and train them myself through our CRC Academy. But yeah, how do you guys do that? Because, and that ties into this overarching theme of quality oversight. You know, I'm sure you, you are aware of the care access fiasco and I'm sure someone running a IRO looks at that and says, Hey, you know, this could all like blow up in our face. I mean, that business model care access is done yeah, um, because of like a couple screw ups. Like how, how do you yeah. prevent this? This, I imagine this keeps you up at night. It does. I mean, I think fundamentally the staffing situation in clinical research keeps me up. Truth be told, we we saw it's always been the case that coordinators evolve and are kind of taken away to be CRA somewhere else. That's always been the case. And it's extremely detrimental to the sites when that occurs. But when COVID hit and there was this massive influx of, of vaccine trials and things of that nature, we saw an unprecedented amount of coordinators um, being consumed from their jobs to other locations um, or other entities. Um, and so there is this real need to build up the, the knowledge base, the interest in, in, in being a part of clinical trials as part of the workforce. Um, and so we, we actually did build something um, called Summit University for our internal network uh, where we we hone in on the basics of, of clinical trials conduct from a, a whole host of avenues and really enhance upon it. So it's not just the simplified, this is how you do an informed consent, but rather these are the pitfalls of an informed consent. This is what you really need to do. This is what the regulations say and how you execute to the best performance of that regulation. Um, and so we've, we've developed Summit University to use internally with our sites or sites have access to this. Um, and we've added a, a whole host of other uh, areas to include operational expertise and lab expertise, regulatory, and really tried to provide an offering that is valuable to the sites in the network. That's one way that we're really trying to make sure that people have a really strong foundation uh, as they as they do their current job and as they look for their next job, ideally within the site that they're already located. That, that's the, the best thing that we could hope for is that each site has a growth plan for their personnel from within. And so we, we spend a lot of time talking with our sites about what is their growth plan for their individual team members and where do they see from within Within their community or within their practice, where's the next generation and how can we foster their growth from within and help them do that? Um, of course, there are scenarios where that's not possible and you have to look outside and, and bring someone in. As you said, uh, you know, your community, it can be difficult to find someone who's qualified and so you have to grow them in. Um, our HR department does something different. We don't, we don't actually hire this and, and place the staff in the networks. They're independent, but we do help them identify personnel. And so we work with a number of strategic partners um, to help identify potential staff that are willing to either relocate or already in the extending um, communities and place them at, 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 at sites to fulfill the, the staffing crisis that may be um, occurring. So we're looking at every avenue to be able to help the sites and the research community as a whole 
um, fulfill the future generation and the existing generation for their next career move. Mm -hmm. Do you using coordinator like boot camp training uh, providers? Very, very similar. Yeah, very similar. And absolutely. That's that's an absolute pathway. I think there are a lot of platforms out there that that are providing training and there's no reason that we couldn't be partnering together to really solve this problem uh, for a best best in class solutions. Yeah, you, you touch on a really serious problem like Creo and uh, uh, we uh, partnered with TPS to launch a survey of uh, members of ACRP about uh, the clinical research shortage, staffing um, staffing shortage, and it's it's severe. It's um, I think the the um, one in three sites said they've actually turned down a study or stopped enrolling a study because they didn't have the, the personnel. Well, it wasn't because they weren't a good fit; they didn't want it. It's because they just didn't have the personnel. Yeah. Um, so the amount of work that's being you know the sites are asked to absorb is you know a bottleneck in the industry, and I think you touched upon a uh, really good strategy, which is that you're providing a lot of centralized services, right? To offload some of that work. So just, you know, even the feasibility, centralizing that and not having the site have to repeat the same information. Well, you just gave back a number of hours back to their day. Yeah. Um, and I think hopefully our technology is contributing too, because it should be a lot easier to onboard a new coordinator, right? A lot Absolutely. of the mistakes, yeah. And you're designing the source templates, you're building quality of funds. So that's going to save a lot as well and make it a little bit more accessible clinical research. You don't have to rely on someone who have been doing this for five years and, and you know, do as everything by intuition. Um, you could build more standardization. Yeah, I completely agree. We should, we should probably talk about our CRC Academy. Um, we've been running it since 2019, <laughs> training coordinators across the country. Yeah. Um, but Raymond does bring up an interesting point and I've been talking to you because of our our brand, we're getting some more exposure. We have AMCs reaching out, hey, we want customized training solution. Yeah. And the more tech gets integrated into sites, whatever the tech may be, I mean, we love Creo, but whatever they're using, there's a way to customize training specific to that organization. So if you're a Creo site, hey, good, good news. You know, we have Creo for our internship. So you're going to you're going to learn the fundamentals, then you're going to get your hands dirty with Creo, or if it's Red Cap or something else. So I think training itself is going to get more customized because of the tech, right? And I think that's something interesting to look out for. We're going from like just the fundamentals to cu highly customized for that IROs or that site's specific needs. So I think that's something that's going to be changing over the next decade as well. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I think I think it has to evolve into that. If if you want sites to perform at their best, it is not a cookie cookie cutter industry. Every mm -hmm. site does not um, affect their clinical trial exactly the same. It has to work for the structure, the space, the resources. All of those factors have to be taken into account to to provide the best solution for that site. And and because of that, customized training is is an essential. How, international um, and thank you so much guys for your time um i know we're coming up on on the hour but international is something interesting to me as well you guys do have a significant international presence do you find that this is a demand for u.s studies that need international sites or is there like a separate market just for the international sites there is there is absolutely a need in this therapeutic for for ex us sites. Um, the majority of Nash patients are enrolled from within the U.S., so you see this very strong contingency um, coming from from the U.S. But there are patients with this disease all around the world, and certainly you know we see this very, very heavily in the Hispanic communities. Mexico is, is um, you know, got some very strong centers for, for NASH research. And so we've, we've strategically um, aligned and, and worked together because, because genetically the Hispanic population does develop a more severe form of, of NASH mm -hmm. more often than not. And so absolutely. But we also see this in the Asian community. There's a strong um, contingency of NASH in the Asian community. And so there is room for evolution across the globe for, for this therapeutic area in particular. And then as far as the monitoring, um, 
or the data management, I guess the data management side's the same, no matter where in the world they are with Creo, you, you have access to the EDC, um, the back end. But when it comes to um, monitoring, for example, or QA, let's call it QA, uh, do you have to have connections in, let's say, Mexico for, I mean, you're not going to fly your QA from San Antonio to Mexico, or maybe you do. So, so we would, we would periodically, but you certainly wouldn't need to routinely if you mm. have um, a, a, an e-source solution, if you mm. can, if you can evaluate it through the system. So as Creo evolves and, and looks at, at where their um, XUS expansion will go, that will be a benefit certainly to, to uh, summit and entities like us. Yeah. No, I love this. I mean, this is, I think this is where the industry's headed. Um it's very interesting to see the landscape evolve. We were supposed to start with this, but maybe we'll end. Like the big news this week was CVS pulled the plug on its clinical trials. Um, just from a outsider's perspective, Gail, what what are your thoughts on this? Well, you know, I think it was an innovative approach, um, uh, um, but. I'm not sure, you know, I, I would love to say I have the answers. I don't, I don't have the answer on, on why this failed. Um, uh, it, it could be, it could be wrong timing um, in, in an industry that is, um, you know, evolving. I, I, I don't really have the right so answer for why. I'd love to hear your thoughts though. Probably, I mean, my thoughts are, I could have told them this would have happened. Like the margins are just not there. The on-ramp's not there. There must have been other reasons where a lot smarter people than me uh, figure it out, probably having to do with the pharmacy benefits manager and getting yeah. the drugs approved and um, maybe the data, like they have access to tremendous data from, from patients uh, standpoint. But so there must have been a way to like synergistically tie in these other business models that they have. But clinical research as its own business model makes no sense to me at CVS. I mean, a lot of these trials are so complex. Like, how are you going to do it in a little cubicle at your corner or grocery store or pharmacy? Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Very, Go ahead, Brenda. It is a very unique industry. It's extremely specific workflows. It's very different from healthcare. And that's why, you know, doctors who haven't done research before, they're not necessarily research ready. Um, and so I think it, um, I believe in the last couple of years, it's been a swing back to people really understanding the fundamentals of the fundamental role that experience sites and experience operators play yeah. in uh, clinical trial delivery. Yeah. I, 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 I think I agree with you. I think um, I would have I would have liked to see CVS take more of the of the um, of the learnings from the research industry itself. I agree with you. It's not like healthcare. It's not a plug and play sort of scenario. It's it's pretty specialized. Um, but but I, I think I think seeing the evolution of clinical trials that used to be only done in universities and hospitals and into now independent. Uh, institutions, there was an opportunity, um, I think, that that wasn't realized. Yeah, and I think it's a good idea on paper. I mean, I'm sure a lot of these pharma companies, board directors, there's a revolving door between them and, and CVS um, sharing, swapping board members. Sure. And somebody thought, hey, this can be great. Let's just work with each other. Uh, you go back there and we'll get a study. Uh, and then we have farm techs that we can use as our CRCs, but like the staffing, all the stuff we talked about here, these are problems they're going to have to deal with. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, we see that on a smaller scale that we see these sort of things happening sometimes in physicians offices where they say, I'm going to get into research today mm -hmm. and I'm going to use my existing staff and I've read the regulations and I'm good to go. And it's, it's just not that simple. Right. Just like we think, you know, like the novice CRAs think, oh, okay, SDV, I could check what's on this paper, what's on the EDC. It's kind of the same concept, like oversimplification of a very complex and increasingly so. I mean, these studies are getting more complex and not, they're not getting easier. Yeah, I completely agree. I think IROs are the way to go um, going forward. Right. Just on that last point, Dan, I, I do think when I look at what's happening in the industry, there's a lot of site network consolidation going on. A lot of that is under common ownership, but 
they could also have models like some in clinical where it's a, it's more of a feder federation approach. But as sites come together in aggregate and are able to deliver large amounts of PIs and patients, you know, on mass, then it really opens the question: Is there a business model out there? for an integrated site network that could also deliver the data as well, especially with like tools like ours that are extremely site centric and site native It leverages, you know, the everyday workflows and then just yeah. surfaces the data to the sponsors that they need. So, so is, is there a hybrid right between the site network and the CRO? Is there an emerging business model? I think it's, I think, I think it's going to happen. All aspects, like all these little pain points that we discussed, and we can go two more hours and come up with like a dozen others. You know, there's probably a tech solution for it, or at least somebody smart is going to be working on it. Um, I mean, we're still early in this decade. Uh, AI, we haven't even discussed AI. Like, you know, we're as if we're living in a vacuum and AI is not going to impact our industry somehow. Uh, it definitely will. Mm -hmm. So, I think everything's getting more niche, right? Like even this trainings, like my CRC Academy. Yeah. It started out as a, just three years ago, four years ago, started out, okay, we're going to teach the fundamentals. Well, now individual AMCs are reaching out. Hey, I want a tailored solution. Okay, well, we're going to leverage some tech and make it just for you. And I think all these, all these vendors are going to try to do something similar to kind of tie in these pieces together. Yeah. Yeah. There's no doubt tech integration is essential. Um, it, it is the future and, and, and partnering with others that have tech solutions is, is essential as well. Well, Gail, Ray, thank you guys so much for coming on. Um, we definitely need to have you back. I look forward to seeing um, your, your organization grow and see what it's capable of doing this decade and, you guys are just getting started. I mean, 2018 was not that long ago. No, nope, we're just getting started. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's pretty fast growth in a short period of time in the middle of a pandemic. Throw in a pandemic in, in between, which must have affected your studies to some degree. Um, yeah, without a <laughs> doubt it did. I mean, it affected everybody, but we 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 were able to persevere because of the connection that we have with the sites and the connection that they have with each other. So um success story still yep well thank you so much everybody go check out the link underneath the video and if you're listening on the podcast in the show notes go connect with gail go check out creo go check out some of the other sponsors and uh get informed guys all right thank you guys so much thank, thank you dan you.